we're going to be talking first about uh, what a winning proposal is. And I want to do a deep dive into what a winning proposal is to help you understand that. Um, today's training, by the way, can be used by uh, anybody who, whether you're in a position of as a prime contractor or a subcontractor, right? Knowing what I'm about to tell you is really important. Whether you're new to government contracting or whether you've been in this 20 years and you're in a company that's a $20 million or a $20 billion company, the ideas are the same. So if you're a new business, just figure out where you fit and how you can help uh, the prime contractor, for example, write winning proposals by paying attention to some of the tips I'm talking about. You might be expected if you're a subcontractor to be providing uh, data, data call, answering data calls and providing pages, right? Paragraphs or pages about the technical approach. Well, you wanna listen to the tips I'm gonna give you today so that what you write that's part of the prime contractor's response um, really rises up to the level I want to teach you. Uh, so I I did um, a lot of proposals. I, I spent 20 years as a small business owner in the federal market, and I wrote almost every single one of the proposals myself. One of the reasons it was so easy is because our company was very focused on a core competency, and I happened to be a technical expert in that competency. So uh, when we would see a, a PWS, a performance work statement, or a set of requirements, I could turn right to the whiteboard with my uh, team and we would just go to town saying, what does this look like? What are we doing? And so I have a lot of personal experience there, but it came from me really knowing more about writing proposals from an engineer's perspective or, or techie's perspective. I knew what should be in here to lead to the work. I could do the pricing for that company because I knew exactly what the pricing was like. Um, and over the last five years, since I sold my last company, I've really been trying to um, uh, develop this set of processes that you can use in this way that you can begin to look at um, tying together the sales effort, what, what I call business development and capture activities. This is the beginning part of the sales effort to the end of the sales effort, which is the proposal writing, right? And bringing those together to deliver a winning proposal. And that's what I want to share with you here. Um, some ideas about what a winning proposal is that I've discovered or that I've just documented. It's not like discovery is kind of a tough word, right? But that I begin to document in a way that's so clear to me, that's so clear to my customers when I teach them about it. But one um, main idea about what a winning proposal is, is that it's a proposal that a contracting officer would be sure of um, their decision to award on behalf of the government. If you submit a proposal and it's a winning proposal, the contracting officer can look at this and say, if I awarded this to your company, I would have confidence that you're going to deliver well for my agency and the mission of my agency, right? That's a big part of what they need. And so fundamentally, that's what a winning proposal is. I'm going to give you depth on that. But the idea is that you want to write proposals that the contracting officer looks at because, man, I wish I could award this to you. Uh, you know, but there's three companies that have winning proposals. I'm not saying how to write the very best proposal that beats out everybody else. Right. I, I don't really have that knowledge, but I have a way of writing the best proposal for you that a contracting officer looks at it and feels bad. They didn't award it to you. Right. That's what a winning proposal means to me at a very high level. So first and foremost, when you think about what's in a proposal, um, a winning propo proposal must be compliant. Right. It must be compliant with all those shall statements. And so uh, to me, I call this the ante of getting in the game. If you're familiar with poker, you've got to throw in a, a couple of dollars or something to get started in the game. They call it an ante. And I consider um, writing a compliant, any compliant activity in a proposal, writing a proposal to meet compliant needs is just the ante to get in the game. Everybody should be doing that. There's nothing spectacular about doing that, but you must do it, right? And so you can't have a winning proposal if your proposal is not um, compliant because they'll just swipe to the left and say, no, you're off, uh, you're not compliant, you're not even in consideration anymore. And so the first thing is a proposal absolutely must be compliant. Do me a favor, just come along with me and put be compliant into the chat. So we're reminding ourselves what must be in this proposal or what a winning proposal is. Um, so be compliant in the chat. Second thing is it must be compelling, right? It must be giving the contracting officer and the technical review team great confidence when they look at this. And so when I talk about co um, compelling, you want them to look at this and go, wow, these people really get us. They get our mission and what we're trying to do. They, they get our requirements, um, where we're trying to go there, uh, why we're doing this, why we're letting this requirement out or why we're doing this activity within our agency and how uh, you know, your company will help them. And so you must be compelling 
in a way that gives them the confidence when they look at it, they're like, absolutely. If I award to this company, they can do the work, right? This goes into the criteria that you'll see in an RFP that um, how they, the evaluation criteria and how they look at it. But fundamentally, there's compliance and then there's compelling. And compiling is really that ranking of the um, evaluation criteria, whether they say you're satisfactory, there's nothing too compelling about satisfactory or whether you know, you're above satisfactory, whether you've just really nailed it. And that's what you need to be aiming for is how do we really demonstrate to them that in this section or this section or this section, um, we give them the confidence that we get them and that our solution is the right solution to meet their requirements. And so uh, put be compelling into the chat if you get that, right? Is winning proposals must be compelling in a way that's gonna give the evaluation team, the tactical and the uh, acquisition folks, confidence in your proposal and in your ability to deliver. The next one is um, winning proposals must be persuasive. And so this is where I want you to put back the sales into uh, proposals. I feel like sometimes um, the proposal exercise for a lot of companies are getting, are just way too compliant focused and, and they've lost track of the fact that a proposal is a sales document. It's nothing else. It's not a, um, informative document. Uh, actually, if you think about speeches or, or um, uh, anything people write down, they can fall into three categories, right? They can be educational, they can be um, entertaining, or they can be persuasive. So I'm either trying to entertain you and, and uh, like a Dan Brown book on Da Vinci Code or something, a fiction book is entertaining. You read that. Um, if I give a speech that way, all of my talks are all educational, right? I'm trying to teach you something out there. Sometimes I might slide in a little bit of persuasion and entertainment, but really I'm an educational speaker. I'm here to coach you and train you. And then there's persuasive persuasion, right? You're trying to convince somebody to go in a particular direction. Well, that's what your proposal should be. They should be persuasive, driving this, uh, this um, driving the direction that your customer is going to take, right? You want to be able to show them the transformation that they want. They're setting us. Uh, they're saying, here's a set of requirements, right? But there's this goal they're trying to achieve, not just the stated objectives or something that's in an RFP, but what are they trying to do? Are they trying to have, um, you know, when you think about what your solution can deliver for them, does it make their life so much better? I used to tell, in my last company, I used to tell everybody in the staff, we don't just provide SharePoint solutions to the Department of Veterans Affairs, right? Um, we don't provide IT solutions to the Department of Veterans Affairs we improve the quality of, of health care to veterans across America because of whatever we're doing, it enables the providers, the doctors, nurses, et cetera, to be able to deliver faster, better quality care to the patients. And so that's what you want to think is like, where is that end game of the RFP you're responding to? Not just, hey, we provide SharePoint solutions. It's like, great, well, that's compliant. That's what I asked for. But it, when you're persuasive, you're showing them um, this idea of how your how your solution and your approach can help transform the quality of their service to wherever they're going to go or the or the the ability to deliver their mission. Um, you also want to be able to you know when you think about persuasive, you want to be able to answer the question about why your solution is the right solution. Uh, I've heard this from contracting officers before, where they talk about uh, they they mention that uh, people will respond to them and they'll say we recommend this solution. But they don't come with the why. They're, they're not persuading the reviewers on why this solution is the right one. And, and a very simple example of how you might be able to do that is to sit there and say, we recommend this solution over this other solution, which might be what your competitors are recommending or whatever. And the reason why is this and, and kind of guide them to your decision on, on the best solution. Your company knows the best solution, but it's because you've spent so much time getting to that point, right? There's a reason I got to this point of saying, this is what a winning federal proposal looks like, but I need to walk you through that decision-making process as well and help you understand why this solution is better than just a purely compliant solution. So um, if you're following along with what I'm saying there, put be persuasive into the chat. Let me know you're tracking on that, be persuasive. And the last one, and this is one of my favorite ones that I think, um, I feel like I'm one of the only ones saying it, but if there's others, that's great. Uh, but I want you to, when you think about a winning proposal, we're in a whole different world than we were last year, last decade, right? Um, and so always think about where you are today. I want your proposals, when you think about a winning proposal, I want you to think that it should be a page turner for the program office technical reviewers. 
Literally, I want you to think. It's like they're looking at this page like, oh, my God, what happens next? Right. It's like going forward. And you think to yourself, well, how can I do that? Well, if you're not doing that, then you're creating this really boring miter type like document that is just technically proficient and compliant. But you're not you're not pulling any energy um, from this reviewer. You're not doing anything except for them looking and going, yeah, they address this. Yeah, they address this. You want to be able to be. Um, you know, going back to persuasion, but you want to be exciting for them. And, and I don't mean overly uh, Top Gun Maverick movie type exciting, but just enough where you're waking them up. And so you have a page turner of a proposal that um, puts the sales back into your proposal. You want them to turn the page when you're when they're looking at a solution or the, or the way you talk about it. Here's an example is my uh, when I wrote proposals, it was SharePoint migration. As an example, I would say, hey, this is how we're going to work with your uh, stakeholder users, and we're going to rack and stack the applications they have in complexity, um, three different levels. What are those levels? You know, you turn the page to find out, find out that next level. And I know I'm trying to put a little bit of uh, um, excitement into it, but I literally mean that because our attention uh, uh, spans are so small now, and we're looking for entertainment in all aspects of our life. It doesn't um, mean I want you to come in with a song and a dance, but I do want it to be engaging. And that's what I mean by page turner. Every page is kind of engaging me. I'm seeing you come in and working with me. And so I want to turn the next page and go, okay, and then what? And then what, right? That's what I mean. It's really that then what? So put page turner in there if you're going to commit to uh, creating page turner proposals in the future. Okay. So let me give you some tips now on um, how to write a winning proposal. And these are high level tips uh, to think about, uh, you know, writing winning proposals. I'm not trying to go into section L and M and all that kind of stuff. That's, there's so many people who've got that covered. But an example of uh, a tip for how to write winning proposals is begin with the end in mind. And Stephen Covey is, has this as one of his seven habits of highly effective people is begin with the end in mind. And so if you look at the end and you say, I want to write a winning proposal. We want to write a winning proposal. How are we going to write a winning proposal, right? I'll give you some tips right now, but beginning with the end in mind means talk, have your proposal team and your um, sales team, your capture and your business development team, um, have them come together and actually understand, learn the process together, teach uh, all of yourselves, all of you, the same process. So you're following along. An example is if we want to talk to the customer challenges, and the end, the end in mind, begin with the end in mind says, in our proposal, we really want to make sure we're clarifying that we understand your challenges. Well, okay, so beginning with that end in mind now tells us, let's make sure we're out there learning about challenges that aren't just in the RFP, right? This is sales, this is capture, is going and, and business development. This is getting out to the agency, talking to the customer, understanding their challenges, pulling threads on whatever you see in the PWS or strategic documents. But you want to make sure all of your team Anybody who's involved in it, and I guess I get that there's some companies, uh, some of you who are watching are like much smaller and the whole team is you, right? But um, as you grow, this process has generally three parts to the sales process, right? Business development, capture and proposal. So that whole group, get them all working together. The next thing, um, number two, the second tip for how to write winning proposals is to write incrementally through the life cycle. I often see companies waiting to the end or they, they uh, like Anytime I hear somebody having to write at night or on weekends, there's something off with the process, right? I don't mean to knock it. And I sure as heck spent a lot of times writing on nights and weekends. But if you stretch this out through the entire life cycle of, of an opportunity sales cycle, then you won't have to spend as many nights and weekends. But um, the idea of writing incrementally is you can do many drafts as you go along. And so here's an example. If I'm finding out about an opportunity uh, at a customer and I think the RFP is going to drop in six months, like that's a, a good small window for doing capture. Well, say I get in there and I just want to understand what are some of their objectives and their challenges? Well, those two, if I can begin to have early discussions with them about that, forget about solutioning. I haven't even got to that, right? Just what are you guys running into at your agency? What are some of your hopes and goals? I, I do some research. I get their documents. I can begin to write a simple one page draft of their um, of the objectives, our understanding of your challenges. Right. And then because I'm a capture or business developer writing some of that, I might not be the final editor on that. But then I can pass it to the, the proposal team who begins to look at it and say, I see where you're going. Right. And I'm going to talk in a minute about having 
um, more, well, actually the next tip I have is, is have um, early and frequent meetings between proposal and capture folks. And what I mean is 15 minute meetings, none, none of these 30 or hour long meetings or more, right? 15 minutes, we come in and say, hey, I got something on, on challenges. Let's look at it. Let's, let's talk about it a little bit and let's take some action items away. But if you do this, I, this um, if you start writing incrementally throughout the entire life cycle, you don't wait till the RFP is a month away or even till the RFP drops, which some people do, right? Start early and just slowly start working it. You can do this in an hour a week. If you start six months out, an hour a week dedicated to writing, and you'll find by the time the RFP drops, you've got a really good um, understanding of what you're going to put into that response, perhaps even 60 to 80 percent done. Um, and that's something you should be able to see. Another tip that I have, number four here, is uh, look at every single word of a draft PWS or statement of work um, inside of these documents. When you look through, I like to point out um, there's you have shall statements, right? They'll point out really directly the contractor shall do that. Those are obvious. Everybody sees them. But as you read through the words and you begin to understand what each sentence is talking about, you'll be able to uncover um, a problem statement and an implied solution statement. So in a problem statement, um, might be defined or, you know, it could be an implied problem. But when you read a sentence and they say, hey, we want our service to go faster. Why are your servers not going fast enough now? And so if you can begin to look at that um, in each word, you'll be able to understand more and more about the, these documents. They're never more than, I don't know, let's say 25 pages, right? If you have a bigger opportunity, you got more people and that's fine. But, you know, let's say 25 pages for the technical meat of a, um, an RFP or a draft PWS uh, getting rid of all the extra fluff in there. If you take the time to read that over a, a period of a week or two, you'll pull out a lot of nuggets. And I do this a lot with companies that are going after hundred million dollar opportunities, but you could do this at the $10 million level or, you know, lower if you want, but read everything in there. So you understand it and you're speaking to it. If they took the time to put it in, especially in the technical requirements, then there's a reason they put it in. And part of your capture is you can go back and ask them, well, why'd you put that in? It doesn't seem relevant or um, why did you put that in? That seems really important. Can you expand on it? Um, and then the last big tip I have for you, and this one's a huge tip in my mind, is um, write less pages than they're given. So if you get an RFP, it says, hey, you can write 25 page response or 50 or 100. Don't use all the pages. Um, just write less pages. Buyers have a short attention span first off, so they don't want to be looking at 100 pages of your response if you could have said the exact same thing in 50 pages they were just saying well let's here's a limit right it wasn't them saying i would like you to write 100 pages so i can read 100 pages right imagine how boring that is um you want to be concise when you write less pages you want to be concise and and remember and state the bluff for each page or each section bluff is bottom line up front right in the military we used to Think about this when we're doing briefing decks and you have a slide, what's the bottom line up front about this slide? What's the point of this slide? What's the point of this deck? So at the beginning of the briefing, you would say the purpose of this meeting is this. The beginning of maybe each slide, it's really clear right away what you're trying to communicate on each slide. Well, it should be the same thing within your proposal. When you're going to a, a page, a section, whatever you're trying to say, what some general thought um, in there, it should be really clear what's in there and you want to make it concise. Uh, if you can say things with less words, do it, do it with pictures. And I don't mean a picture with a thousand words, but a picture that could communicate a thousand words. Um, if you use this, this is my opinion here is if you use all the pages that are allowed in an RFP, then I would submit you're, you're um, pursuing a page compliance exercise compared to a, uh, a compelling, transformative, um, to the point exercise, right? If you have to, if you tell yourself, I'm gonna use less pages to respond to this, then you have to get really clear about your message, your solution. Why is it better than something else, right? You have to get very clear with this. Do they really need 10 pages for your staffing approach? If they don't need that many, then put it in. Imagine how uh, much better it would be if one page, you could really clearly nail it where they go, yep, uh, 100% get us kind of thing. Um, the last thing about this is last, uh, when you use less pages, you're going to be more compelling. You can't possibly use less pages and still answer the, the, the question of the requirements without being compelling because now you have to really think about this. Uh, Mark Twain once said that uh, if you wanted him to speak for an hour or two at your event, he could do that tomorrow. 
But if you wanted him to speak for one to two minutes at your event, it would take him three or four months of preparation. And it's the same thing here in the proposal, right? Is you want to be able to um, really take the time. This is why I'm saying like a six month window, take the time to write something very concise and compelling um, and not use the pages. So those tips really quick, just remember, begin with the end in mind and bring all your team together to train them. Meet incrementally, I mean, uh, write incrementally throughout the life cycle of an opportunity. And then also have early frequent meetings between the proposal team, whoever that is, one person or many, and the capture manager, business developer, short meetings, but have them frequently. And then look at every word on the PWS to find out these implied problems or solutions and write less pages that are given. So put bluff in the chat if you understand that winning proposals requires you to deliver the bottom line up front value, you know, deliver that value up front. So put bluff, B-L-U-F. Um, OK, so let me drop down to this last thing about why business developers and capture folks should work together. Um, if you're not familiar with DevOps, Dev is development and Ops is operations. So uh, Dev is developing a new application like Microsoft Word, as an example, or Netflix, right? They develop it and operations runs it, make sure it's, it's up and running. In the old days, development used to develop something, throw it over a wall, and these guys would have to figure out how to make it work. Consider Ops proposal and, and BD and Capture are Dev. That's not a good thing. And so DevOps brought these teams together and said, hey, let's get Ops engaged early on so they can tell you what problems might happen in production. And let's get dev sticking all the way to customer satisfaction, not just throwing it over the wall. Proposal and business development folks should come together as well and do something similar. Proposals should come very early in the capture process and help teach the business development and capture people what could be really helpful when it comes time for writing that proposal in the final drafts, et cetera. And the capture and business development people should be engaged in the story part of the proposal writing through to the end. Um, there's three roles. It could be all you in there, but um, you know, you're still going to see the same activity. The other reason you want to get all of your team working together is you can remove the friction and blame game. I often see proposal managers get blamed unfairly for when a, a proposal is lost. I'm like, what are you talking about? That was lost at any given stage or every given stage of the sales life cycle. You don't blame the last person. But when you work together, we get rid of that blame game. We get rid of the friction between those two efforts and you start winning more. Um, and so that's really important. Let me just recap what we talked about today. Uh, what a winning proposal is, some tips on writing a winning proposal, and finally, why BD capture and proposal teams should work together. Do me a favor, put uh, put sales back into your proposals. Um, when you go forward, just that's my tip. I always give you a tip of the day, but this one was so big. All I want you to consider is putting sales back into your proposal, right? Don't let it just be a compliance exercise. If you found today's training valuable, do me a favor, put thanks into the chat for uh, my team and I. We always appreciate seeing that. If you'd like to work with me or my team, we have a BD Accelerator workshop, and we'd love to have your company join us if it's the right stage, generally about a million or more in revenue. You can learn more about sending me a, uh, about this by sending me a message in LinkedIn. I will tell you, we only have two more slots for uh, February, and then we're off until May for that program. So uh, just reach out to me if you want, want to know more about that. And then remember, government contracting, it is not a secret. It's just a process. I'll see you in the next training.